Funding for Shape Realist is provided by Squarespace, the sponsor of today's video. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. For some reason, I constantly get requests to do a Disney 2010s ranking, which like, I've talked about six of these nine movies before. I don't really know what all you expect to get out of this, but what the hell? It's Boxing Day season. Here's your present. Don't say I didn't do anything for you. Yeah. Disney during the 2010s has generally been seen as a middle ground between their hot streak during the 90s and their kinda pathetic showing during the 2000s. Their movies this decade have mostly all been hit with critical and financial success. However, some of these films have definitely been subject to some pretty mixed fan reception, especially as the years have gone on. Still, it would be foolish to say that this output isn't an improvement over the previous decade. But how much of an improvement really? I've been fairly critical to a number of these films over the years, and that's because I care about Walt Disney Animation Studios and want them to continually improve. A sharp contrast to Disney, the soulless, megalomaniacal corporation, which I want to see crash and burn. But the actual animation studio itself? Yeah, I love them. Even if I famously have my problems with some of the directions their films took this decade. Even so, let's take another look at what they put out last decade and see how it all stacks up compared to each other. To quote Luigi when he gets summoned into battle in Smash Bros, let's -a go, but in an exasperated voice. See, the voice is exasperated because I have to talk about Ralph Breaks the Internet again. Disappointment in the game of life! To be honest, I didn't even rewatch it for this ranking. I have nothing more to say about this movie. It's all been covered at length in its own dedicated video. Twice! But for the sake of this ranking's cohesion, let's TLDW that vid real quick. This movie movie sucks. It assassinates Ralph's character and turns him into a blithering man-baby who freaks the fuck out all the time because his only friend, a 10-year-old child, wants to hang out with other people and do other things sometimes. Both of them are horrible friends to each other in ways that don't make sense based on how they acted in the first film. Also, instead of exploring a logical concept for a Wreck-It Ralph sequel like online gaming, they're in the internet because we have to acknowledge products and eBay is a major plot point. And also, Google is here. Isn't that cool? I love Google so so much. Ube Amazon is, is here too. Point. Wow, and that's amazing. Google I can't even. Isn't yes, cool? thank you. <laughs> Can you Ube believe they got YouTube for this? That's, I'm so happy about that this. Cool? Yeah. I love oh, look at that. It's yeah. like yeah. Yeah. Twitter. Because yeah. they got yeah. 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 Twitter yeah. Yeah. Do you want to buy products now? Do you want to buy these now? Oh my Disney. Oh my God, that's so cool. We're at the Disney World place. Wow, Buzz Lightyear to infinity and beyond. Wow, it's Baymax. That's nice. Whoa, it's Star Wars. I fucking love Star Wars. Baby Groot, he, he, he likes to say I am wow. Groot, and that's oh like my his catchphrase is that Eeyore from I Winnie the Pooh, Disney all the Disney princesses are here, Eeyore. and that's Eeyore. epic. Eeyore. Merida Eeyore. from the hit 2012 wow. picture wow. film Brave is here too. The movie tries to tell a compelling story about letting your friends go, but it utterly fails because of how bastardized the characters are, and because the directors forgot that leaving your game was what the villain did in the first movie, but now Vanellope will do it with no conversation about it or consequences. There's a good song and spam shows up. That's all the good stuff in this movie. That's that's it. It didn't have time for other good stuff like Felix or Calhoun or jokes that were actually funny because Ralph was too busy making an eye Disney? makeup tutorial. Oh, God, oh look so at that. He's a screaming goat also, now. Wow. Flossing. Oh my god. I love Flossing in Fortnite. Hey look, there's Fortnite. Wow, he's gonna be so happy with That's all Oh my god. Epic baking fail. Whoops. I can't believe I failed the baking so bad. Oopsies. Is this good yet? Is this worth the fucking Academy Award for Best Animated Feature yet? 3 out of 10, it's the worst movie they made this decade by a landslide and I don't want to think about it ever again. I'm sure I will, however. Anyway, yeah, that's the only outright bad Disney animated movie this decade. Now for the mediocre ones. This is gonna take a while. I've made a huge mistake. Oh my god, Professor Callahan is so stupid. Did he even once consider the fact that his daughter is still alive and trapped in the alternate dimension? A real dad would have resolved to rebuild the portal and go in there to get her back. And the fact that he doesn't do this is even worse when you consider that she's still alive. It just occurred to me on this rewatch how ridiculous it is that he goes to the trouble of rebuilding the portal, but not actually using it to try and save his daughter, but because he wants to suck up Cray's fancy new building. He might actually be the dumbest, most incomprehensible Disney 
villain of all time. At least the Zootopia sheep and Hans had cunning plans that were logical, even if they were revealed to be evil in stupid ways and didn't need to be in the movie. How come a character as smart as Callahan is said to be never once makes a good decision throughout the entirety of this movie? I guess you can say that was emblematic of how Big Hero 6 is not really a good movie. This is one of those Disney films that just never works for me and continues to not work for me the more I rewatch it. Baymax is amazing and every time he's doing funny shenanigans on screen, the movie is good. But then they drop the funny Baymax shenanigans pretty quickly in favor of a tepid, boring, played out superhero origin story. I just watched this movie and I cannot remember a single character trait any of these side characters have. Can you? What is this girl's name? Um, it's, um, I, uh... What is this girl's name? Uh... I don't know. I just watched this movie and I don't know. Oh wait, I remember this guy's name. It's Wasabi because he spilled Wasabi on his shirt and then they gave him that name forever. Why? Nothing TJ Miller says is funny, it's all annoying, and I hate him so much. Tadachi is great while he's around, and ultimately I like the message this movie's trying to portray about grief. A lot of scenes that focus on that concept are actually pretty effective. But it really all falls apart when you're supposed to contrast Hero's grief at losing a loved one with Callahan's. Cause Callahan doesn't feel like he's grieving. He just feels like a one-dimensional monster who never even cared about Abigail, or Tadachi, or any of his other students that he is now trying to murder for no real reason. Is this what Abigail would have wanted? Oh, it doesn't matter, she's gone anyway. Way, lol. But I'm doing all this murder and destroying Cray's shit because I miss her. I miss her a lot. I'll be back. But who gives a shit what she wanted? I don't. To be honest, I will never get tired of dunking on Professor Callahan. He's just such a fascinating failure of a twist villain in every way. And he's the only thing I feel passionate about in this entire boring ass movie. Well, him and Baymax. Good to know this movie has its fans. I'm not one of them. Also, now that I've seen the best animated movie ever made, The Tale of the Princess Kaguya, I just want to point out that this... Big, Big Hero, Hero 6. 6 might be the most embarrassing fuck up in Oscars history. Aside from Brave and Happy Feet winning Best Animated, Ralph Bricks the Internet, Boss Baby and Shark Tale getting nominated for Best Animated, Crash winning Best Picture, Green Book winning Best Picture, Bohemian Rhapsody winning Best Editing, Suicide Squad 2016 winning anything, Rise of Skywalker getting nominated for Best Score, Michael Keaton losing Best Actor, Shakespeare in Love winning Best Picture, The King's Speech winning Best Picture, Todd Phillips getting a Best Director nomination, The Horrendous Moonlight La La Land fiasco, The Horrendous doing Best Actor last as a tribute to Chadwick without Chadwick winning fiasco, The Horrendous Jimmy Kimmel hosting two years in a row somehow fiasco. Wait, what was I even talking about? mistake. Well, this sucks. I haven't gone back to rewatch Frozen 2 since it first came out two years ago, because why would I? But on this rewatch, the movie started to make a lot more sense. Not the plot or anything, no, that shit is still messy and confusing as ever. But the fact that it was messy and confusing made so much more sense after watching the behind the scenes documentary on Disney Plus that details just how troubled this movie's production was and how wildly far they got into development without figuring out who the voice calling Elsa even was. It's a miracle that the movie is as watchable as it is, but that's about as far as I can go with praising it. It's watchable, but not really good. But you can tell that it could have been if they had time to iron out the script instead of turning this first draft in just to appease the Mouse's capitalistic machinations. There are glimpses of good writing here, like Elsa's story is far more compelling than it is in the first movie, and I really like her journey of self-discovery. The first 30 minutes or so are well paced and build up the mystery in a really intriguing way. Anna feels a lot more mature and you can tell she grew as a person ever since the last film. There's solid stuff here, but it all falls apart by the end because this movie misses the mark on the little details and the big picture. As soon as they get to the magical forest barrier, the plot just stops flowing and turns into loosely connected scenes. Here's everyone being lost. Now it's an Olaf song. Now it's everyone being lost again. Now they're meeting a bunch of characters that don't factor into the plot whatsoever and could be cut without anything changing. Now it's everyone being lost again. Now it's a Kristoff rock power ballad with singing reindeer. Okay, now Kristoff's out of the movie for the next 30 minutes. Bye! Now it's everyone being lost- Okay, okay, so let me see if I understand the plot correctly. Anna and Elsa's mother saved her father's life, and so the forest spirits decided to reward her by giving her daughter ice powers she can't control that left her isolated from everyone else, including her sister, and which ultimately led to both of the parents' untimely death when they went out looking for answers on how to fix the ice curse. What a great gift. 
Thanks for that, spirits. So now Elsa is being called by a memory of her mother, I guess, in order to watch a magic snowman version of her grandfather reenact that time he attacked the peaceful tribe living here, because they just noticed after the dam was built that the dam was not a good thing for them. Then she freezes to death, but she can magically send a snow telegram to Anna that showcases their grandfather attacking the other guy, and Anna immediately realizes that that means they need to break the dam somehow. Like, immediately, she understands that this snow sculpture in front of her equals the dam must be destroyed. How did she figure that out? And when did Elsa learn how to send magical snowman telegrams that somehow hone in on Anna's exact location because there's no way she could have known where she was? Also, I really hate to be this guy, but when the four elements are air, fire, earth, and water, and you want to add a fifth element, why would it be frozen water? Because that's what ice is. Can't wait for the mud elemental and the noxious fumes elemental. The songs are mostly forgettable, honestly. The only two bangers in the soundtrack, in my opinion, are Show Yourself and, of course, Lost in the World. And as much as I love that song, it really just has no plot relevance. It was just thrown in because we didn't let Jonathan Groff sing enough last time. That's the actual reason it was added. Watch the documentary. It's in there. <laughs> and I will never get over what a fucking terrible cop-out the ending is. Why shouldn't Arendelle be destroyed as a symbol of atoning for the sins of the past? And then rebuilt by Anna and the current people of Arendelle as a symbol of them building a better future. There's no one in the kingdom right now. It's completely empty. The climax hinges on Elsa saving a bunch of worthless buildings from being destroyed. That ain't heroic. That's just tacky. Frozen 2 is just a tacky, cheap movie that had so much potential to outdo the original. It really wasn't a high bar to clear, and yet this one practically tripped underwater. Who in the halibut trips underwater? You know what I'm saying? No, no one does. I'm the only person who speaks Shark Tale. The point is, this is a mess. They should have thought out the story at some point before making it. Kristoff should have married that other reindeer guy. Matthias should have mattered to the story. Olaf should have shut the f*** up. But it was still funny when he reenacted the first film, so I guess Frozen 2 has that going for it. Oh yeah, I watched those other shorts where he reenacts other Disney movies, and actually those were kind of funny too. Or maybe I was just tricked into liking them because he dresses Tomatoa that one time. I think I may have Stockholm Syndrome, so I'm going home. Oh man, my nuts are freezing, kid. I'm about this bitch. Peace! Watching Frozen Frozen again is a never-ending stream of, hey, this is really fun, actually. I see why people liked this. Mixed in with, this stupid-ass movie, why did it ever get so popular? However, I don't dislike Frozen for its popularity. In fact, I don't dislike it at all. It's perfectly okay. What sets it apart from the second film and makes it just a bit better is its memorability. Like, Frozen may have such a dumb twist villain and such a dumb side villain and such a dumb rock troll song that's so stupid and I hate it so much, but at least I remember these elements. It's kind of fun to go back and grown and how cringeworthy it is to put on an awkward, terrible love ballad at a point in the story where Anna's heart is freezing to death. It's funny to see how many ways the inciting incident could have been avoided. Like, even if Elsa's not ready to open up about her ice powers, she just needs to say, we'll talk about this later, Anna, and walk out. Not carelessly try to yell back at her while her ice generating hand is exposed. I still think they really half-assed the way Elsa's depression was portrayed, and they could have actually explored it during the second half of the movie. Maybe through more visually creative ways similar to that vision the rock troll gave her at the beginning. I think it could have been really powerful to see her working through these feelings, and it probably could have helped a lot of people in the audience struggling with similar feelings. But that's just something I wanted to see, not really a critique of something actually in the movie. My opinions on the songs haven't really changed. Half the songs are good, like Love's an Open Door, Let It Go, First Time in Forever, Original and Reprise, etc. The other half suck, like the Cutting Ice song. I guarantee you that even the most die-hard Frozen fan is unable to remember the lyrics to the Cutting Ice song. Your three-year-old does not sing along to it whenever you show them this movie. If if I ever see a three-year-old singing along to the Cutting Ice song, I will literally drink water. With ice. Look, Frozen ain't that great, but it does actually have some really good elements. Olaf is somewhat enjoyable here, just like how the minions were somewhat enjoyable in the first Despicable Me, and then never again. Olaf, Kristoff, and Anna make for a great trio that play off of each other really well, even though I feel very little romantic chemistry between Anna and Kristoff. They genuinely give off more sibling energy than anything, which is horrific to think about, but maybe Disney should think about putting believable romances into their movies. Ooh, hey. Bada bing! The movie's actually really well directed, and a lot of the scenes have sufficient tension. Plus, it looks real pretty. And like, that's it. It's frozen, I don't know, what, what do you want from me? I don't think my opinion on this movie will ever really change again. Give me suggestions for what to talk about the next time it appears in a ranking video. I have nothing left to milk with this movie. Unlike Disney! Ooh! Hey! 
Bada bing! Also, the fact that no one in this movie knows how to end the eternal winter is so dumb because they can just look it up online. Easy peasy, I just saw Frozen. Got him. Oh, wait, what am I talking about? Google wasn't invented back in ancient Frozen times. Uh, silly me. But you know what probably was around during those times? Some sort of website that would tell you how to end the eternal winter. And that website was made using Squarespace. I guarantee it. Squarespace is a fantastic, intuitive online website builder that allows you to create beautiful websites for your business or personal hobby. Present your work using Squarespace's professional portfolio designs. Display projects in customizable galleries and add password protected pages to share private work with clients. You can even present your videos from YouTube, Vimeo, and Animoto on your Squarespace site. Add an image overlay to your video to improve your website's load speed by waiting to embed video players until playback starts. Every design automatically includes a unique mobile experience that matches the overall style of your website, so your content will look great on every device every time. And if you don't want that, you can always disable the mobile view from Website Manager. Buying a domain from Squarespace is simple because there are no hidden fees or price hikes. Each domain comes with an ad-free parking page and free WHOIS privacy on eligible domains. Squarespace sells over 200 top-level domains so you can find the perfect name for your website. Choose a URL that ends in .com, .net, .org, or if you're feeling funky you can get a more specific one like .art. If you're ready to share your passions or promote your business with the rest of the world, head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. And now the fucking honey's gone! Winnie the Pooh 2011 is the only 2010's Disney movie I never saw before making this ranking. And it sure is a movie that exists. This is actually the first Winnie the Pooh movie I've seen from beginning to end, so I can't speak to its quality in comparison to the other ones, but on its own... It's fine. It's light, fluffy, charming, all that jazz. I just don't think it's anything substantial or great. I can watch a wholesome as heck movie like Paddington, or a short like the Wallace and Gromit misadventures, and get really sucked into their charming, whimsical, simple worlds. But this movie in particular was a bit lacking, and I wasn't as sucked in as I wish I could have been. I think the story about preparing to fight the Baxen just got really old, and I wish they elected to do a more episodic film, with more variety in terms of the plot and the characters that we're focused on. I think Rue got like two lines in this, and Kanga doesn't fare much better. The songs are charming and sweet in the moment, but unmemorable in the long run. Piglet's voice actor in this really rubs me the wrong way, but everyone else was solid. I don't know, Pooh, oh, but it sounds like a good thing. Sometimes the animation gets creative and fun, like this honey hallucination song Pooh has because he's constantly dying of starvation throughout the entire movie and none of his friends realize this and help him. They literally give an inanimate balloon a pot of honey instead of letting Pooh have it. Bro, he's like the honey guy. That's his whole thing. You are torturing this poor bear, come on! This is the movie that finally made me realize that Tigger gives off serious Kramer energy, like they're practically the same character. I know all these thoughts are really scattershot and this segment is all over the place, but don't worry, I'll have plenty of time to put them all together coherently. Oh, wait, never mind, the movie's over. The credits start rolling 53 minutes in. Why was it so short? Did they cut some stories out because they didn't feel like 2D animating anymore and just wanted to get the movie done? Maybe. Who knows. It's a very nice, cute, charming movie that I just don't think I'm ever going to think about again. Nothing to hate here, but nothing really to fall in love with. It's fine. It's not people. It's animals. California animals. Zootopia is kinda sorta starting to lose me a little bit as time goes on. The more I rewatch it, the less impressed I am with the commentary it presents regarding race. The intentions are certainly good, but the subtlety is just not there. Nearly every conversation any character has in the first 30 minutes of this movie is somehow race related or talking about stereotypes, and it's just so constant that it starts to feel disingenuous. Like these characters aren't characters, they're just mouthpieces for the movie's messages. Which are certainly good messages in theory, but would have been better presented in a more subtle and nuanced way. Show, don't tell. That scene where the rabbit mom brings her daughter closer when a tiger's next to them on the train is still the most powerful scene in the movie, because it's subtle. The rest of the movie seems obsessed with broadcasting its message right in your face throughout the whole thing, but its effectiveness is dampened because it's trying to connect real-world racism issues to prey and predator animals, despite that connection not really making much sense. Previously, I praised this movie for advocating against stereotypes and racism in general without really making any one-to-one -one connections with the real world, but the more I analyze this movie, the more I realize that it clearly wants to say something about the real world. It clearly wants to say something that its characters and world just aren't capable of, because equating predator animals to actual people is really f 
sucked. And I shouldn't have to point that out, Disney. It's really uncomfortable, especially considering how much of the movie's plot hinges on it. So the movie's message and allegory elements have kind of fallen apart for me under scrutiny, but even with that said, this is still one of Disney's better movies throughout the 2010s. It has its fair share of funny moments, and Nick and Judy are charming characters with great chemistry. Once the adventure gets going, they stop hammering the well-intentioned but misguided message into the ground, and then the investigation is fun. I like the little rodent town chase scene and the Godfather reference. There are drug dealers in this movie named Walter and Jesse, which is actually kind of amazing. Hey yo, Mr. White, I'm in Zootopia, bitch! The Shakira song is still terrible, the donut-loving cop is kind of lame. Did he just say, I... he did? I really, really, really hate the nudist colony scene. It's just... No, please stop. The sheep is still so funny to me. I can't believe they even thought this was a good idea for a twist villain. Embarrassing. Actually... I'll kidnap a thousand children before I let this company die. <laughs> And then the movie's over, it's just kinda decent, I guess. It's losing me rapidly, and maybe it won't be so decent the more time passes. But at least it's not a smug subversion of the Disney formula that thinks it's smarter than it is. That's a plus, I guess. Sora, Donald, and... Goofy. Tangled is another Disney movie I haven't had the pleasure of talking about on this channel yet. And it is a pleasure, because Tangled is great. A gorgeous return to form for Disney's traditional fairy tales, after Princess and the Frog started to get there, but fell a little short. And I must emphasize the traditional fairy tales point again, because aside from the 3D animation, this truly does feel like it was plucked straight out of the Disney Renaissance. It's funny, it's heartwarming, it has great songs, Sora, Donald, and Goofy showed up at one point and added nothing to the plot, but it was cool to see them. Wait, I think my copy of the movie is broken. They, they, they're not supposed to be here. Okay, so is this movie perfect? Nah, not really. While the setup of the story is fantastic, I think parts of the first 30 minutes before the adventure really gets started are a bit slow and clunky. I still find Mother Knows Best to be an extremely boring villain song. Like, melodically and lyrically, it's nothing special. It's novel that it sounds so pleasant considering Gothel's manipulating Rapunzel and pretending to be nice, but that's about the only compliment I can give it. And like, in general, it's hard to shake the feeling that this is just a really, really good standard Disney movie, but it doesn't really have any truly exceptional elements. The songs, the story, the characters, almost every aspect of this movie is good or even great, but none of it really ever hits the same highs as the best Disney films that use this musical format. But hey, you know what? That's perfectly fine, because we're still left with a good-ass movie at the end of the day. Rapunzel is great. Her naivete and infectious excitement over everything this world has to offer is so adorable adorable and wholesome. Eugene is hysterical and such a fun co-lead. Zachary Levi gives one of my favorite performances in any Disney movie. The line deliveries and comedic timing contribute to such a charismatic and delightful character. Gothel is a good villain, kinda rehashy of Frollo without leaving the same impact, but still good. Maximus fucking slays me every time he's on screen. I've never seen a horse be this 100% maximum no chill before. What an icon. I've Got a Dream is such a delightful fun song. When Will My Life Begin is a cute opener. And then there's Ice see the light. Mmm, that's Disney magic, baby. The visuals, the vocals, the lyrics, the melody. Yeah, that's the best scene in the movie right there, and one of my favorites in all of Disney. It all comes together right here so beautifully. Just the fact that they have this conversation beforehand about how Rapunzel has wanted to see the lanterns for so long. And that if they're everything she dreamed of, now she gets to find a new dream. And what happens after she finally sees the lanterns? She and Eugene embrace and focus entirely on each other instead of the lanterns, because they're each other's new dream. Bro! Bro, this movie fucking slaps! Why am I so much more invested in Rapunzel and Eugene's romance than Anna and Kristoff's, or Simba and Nala's, or Ariel and Eric's, or Pocahontas and generic white man's? I think it just comes down to the fact that this movie is so laser-focused on the romance for a change. It's not just something they threw on top of another, more compelling central story. It's tantamount to why this story works as well as it does. But Disney's priority has kind of shifted lately, and they don't want to focus on romance anymore because they think it'll make their female characters seem weak. Look man, the fact that their old princesses fell in love wasn't the weak thing. It was the fact that said love was barely developed and forced into the story just because it's a fairy tale trope. There's nothing wrong with having a female character fall in love, as long as you make sure they have a character outside of that love. They pulled this off beautifully with Rapunzel, but then decided it wasn't good enough, I guess, and they needed to be more subversive. Frozen thinks it's so smart by constantly saying, I'm not like other princess movies, and subverting the whole instant romance concept. But then turning around and giving us this half-assed, tepid, milk-toast, will-they-or-won't-they chicanery between Anna and Kristoff. That ain't love. What Rapunzel and Eugene have? 
that's love. You just feel their natural chemistry way more in this movie than in the Frozens. But what really seals the deal is the powerhouse gorgeous musical number that just brings the house down. Just like the title song of Beauty and the Beast and A Whole New World before it. Okay, I think I just talked myself into liking Tangled even more. It really just is Disney's best storytelling attributes in their purest form. It's nothing groundbreaking, it's no evolution of their storytelling style or anything, but it's a gorgeously realized tribute to their past that also offers glimpses at what the future has in store for them. There's this really cool music video bonus feature on the DVD for Tangled that counts up every single Disney animated movie to that point, ending with Tangled since it was their 50th feature film. And watching that as a kid was so cool because of how right it felt. Tangled is the perfect 50th feature milestone, showing both how far Disney has come and also hearkening back to what came before. This is yet another movie I wanted to dedicate a full video to for a while, and maybe someday I shall. Oh, and before you ask, yes, I watched the series. It's pretty good. Varian's the best character, 7 out of 10. Do I look like I need your power? You know how when I ranked all the Pixar movies, I talked about how I almost made it through the entire marathon without crying once, but then Coco was the only one that got me? Well, the same thing happens with this video. And the one movie that made me cry? Wreck-It Ralph, somehow. I'm genuinely really shocked, but man, I just forgot about how good that scene is where he wrecks the cart. Like, this is one of the best executions of the main character splitting up trope I've ever seen. You understand Ralph's motivation perfectly and how he thinks there's no other way to save Vanellope, but it crushes your heart so much because their friendship means so much to you at this point. And from Vanellope's perspective, this is such a gigantic betrayal. He's doing the same thing the Mean Girls did earlier in the movie, and she never expected him to act this way. And King Candy, ooh, that little bitch. You understand why Ralph believes him even if you don't, but also, damn, that slippery little dickwad, he caused all this emotional trauma, oh my god, this is a great movie. I forgot how much I enjoy it, and I fully went into this video expecting to rank it lower than Tangled, but I think it just barely edges it out actually. Again, I'm shocked. It has problems like some annoying immature jokes and a couple cliche elements, but honestly, there's just very little that I really dislike about this movie. It presents such a vivid, expressive world that stands toe to toe with something like Toy Story, in terms of capturing your imagination and getting your mind racing, thinking about all the cool ways video game characters can interact. This movie is so good at doling out information as to how the world works in an efficient manner. There's a lot it needs to explain, but it never feels bogged down by exposition. It all flows seamlessly. The main characters are all charming and likable, and the relationships that grow between them are equally endearing. King Candy was the last time Disney ever had fun with a non-crustacean villain, and he's so delightful while also being legitimately menacing. Perhaps the movie's greatest feat is how seamlessly it brings all these video game characters and universes together without ever feeling like the corporate IP jerk-off fests that would plague cinema in the coming years. All these cameos and references are so tasteful and natural. Nothing about this aspect of the movie is cringeworthy or dated, which is honestly miraculous miraculous. The fact that Bowser and Sonic and Pac-Man have appeared in the Walt Disney Animation Studios canon and it just works makes me so happy. This is just such an easy film to like. It's got great characters, a great concept, beautiful animation that still holds up nearly 10 years later, and some deceptively powerful moments. Gotta give it up for the one and only Wreck-It Ralph film. Yep, no surprises here. Moana is the best Disney movie that came out during the 2010s, and the only one in my opinion that can truly stand toe to toe with their best films during the 90s. It just feels so authentic, like it's not trying to subvert expectations or trick you, nor is it reacting to what's popular at the time, be it stuff from other Disney movies or stuff in the real world. It's just a beautiful, simple, engaging standalone story with the best protagonist of any Disney movie. Yes, I really mean that. Moana is such an engaging heroine because of how a parent her weaknesses are, and watching her overcome these weaknesses is such a profound display of her strength. Imagine not having weaknesses and just being able to fight real good and be a girl boss. That's not strength. There's no growth here. This is worthless. Sometimes the strongest characters are the weakest ones, and such is the case with Moana. She constantly screws up either by overestimating her own abilities or just not really knowing what she's doing most of the time. She just knows that she has to do it because the ocean chose her, and because she believes she's the only one who can deliver Maui and restore the heart in order to save her people. But she's 
burdened with so much imposter syndrome as a result of this, constantly doubting the idea that she's right for this task. But she constantly pushes past her self-doubt and becomes stronger and more capable as a result. She doesn't give in to her ever-present fear of failure and instead becomes the hero the ocean knew she was deep down. As she ultimately saves the day, not through her fighting prowess or even her voyaging skills, but through her unrelenting compassion. Her empathy for Taka and the moment they share right before she restores the heart is one of the most breathtaking moments in any Disney movie. Same goes for the I Am Moana sequence, where she finally comes to terms with who she is after not being sure throughout her entire life up to that point. She's such an amazingly realized protagonist with such incredible, tangible growth over the course of the film. Plus, she's incredibly funny and plays so well off of Maui. This guy, man. This guy right here. It's important to get both Moana and Maui right, because the whole movie basically plays off of their interactions. Not only are said interactions extremely charming and funny, but they really hit you in the feels when they need to. And that's because of how much depth and pain Maui hides underneath his aloof exterior. His backstory is really raw and tragic, even for Disney. And understanding that he did everything for humanity as a way of coping with the fact that his parents just threw him into the sea as a baby? It's messed up. But he learns to grow past this and come to terms with who he is on the inside as well, independent of his status as a demigod savior. Watching Moana and Maui help each other overcome their insecurities and bond is just f***ing phenomenal. This movie has some cliche elements and juvenile humor holding it back from true perfection, but at the end of the day, Moana remains my favorite Disney movie. Not the best, mind you, but my favorite, for so many reasons that I could prattle on about for days. The characters are so fun and have so much subtle depth to them, from Moana to Maui to the ocean. Get it? Get, the ocean has depth, get it? That's comedy, baby. Also, this movie's really funny. The animation is consistently stellar and gorgeous. The action scenes from the Kakamura battle to the Taka confrontation are super well put together and exciting. This movie has the best songs in any Disney movie since Hunchback. Yeah, I said what I said. Where You Are is a great energetic opener. How Far I'll Go is an incredibly compelling I Want song. Your Welcome is a bop that's just filled with infectious energy, great lyrics, and super fun visuals. And, of course... I Am Moana, as I mentioned before, is such a gorgeously realized sequence. Man, I just love this movie to death. I will never get tired of rewatching it. This is such a phenomenally realized film and one of Disney's greatest accomplishments throughout their entire history. I know most people just think this one is good, or even great, and that's about it for them. That's totally fine. But I, for one, think this is a masterpiece. It's a masterpiece. It's a masterpiece. Please, for the love of Tafiti, watch it if you haven't already. I think that's about it. I really hope I didn't forget to talk about anything. Hmm. Oh yeah, this is embarrassing. How did I forget? I wanted to point out how uncomfortable Tafiti's fingers make me. Like, I know that's plants, but it kind of looks like green Cheeto dust and I don't like it. Looking at Cheeto dust on fingers makes me uncomfortable for some reason. This is the only thing wrong with Toy Story 2, which is otherwise a perfect movie. I just, I, I, I don't like Al's Cheeto dust fingers. Okay, now that's everything. Good night, Tri-State area. <laughs> Oh wait, right, there's a crab in this movie. Huh. Yeah, I kinda like the crab. May or may not have based my entire online brand around him after seeing the movie for the first time. May or may not have hosted a YouTube poop collab and a reanimated collab around the scene. May or may not have made an 82 minute feature film slash analysis video about the crab featuring cameos from 40 other content creators and a ton of fans, plus an elaborate YouTube poop-esque ending with original vocals that took me 8 months to put together. Maybe you should check that out if you haven't already. Okay, now that's it. Bye!